Uh, no problem. Uh, do you? I have a PowerPoint to explain. Oh, something. okay, yeah. You have four if you can, um, you can um, share because it's in multiple share. Uh, if you're in Zoom, you yeah. just um, share it, and we're there. There you go. Yeah, I didn't know how formal I should make this. So. Uh, whatever way you want to go, believe uh, me. Um, so I definitely want to speak on kind of uh, the wonderful uh, opportunity and also reality that Philadelphia has a required uh, African American history course. Um, but I also want to like go over some background, what we're doing now, and some of the unintended consequences of making a course like this a required course uh, in order to graduate without the backing almost. So I, I kind of want to introduce all those ideas. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I, it's real interesting to ask that because I always make sure that I introduce myself and like, you know, have this like meet the presenter slide so folks understand the angle in which I come, I'm coming from. So if you look at the picture in uh, on your screen, that's me and my four sons. Uh, Ishmael's the oldest, Khalil, Ezekiel, and Malachi. Um, obviously, I do it for my boys. Uh, Three of them go to Philadelphia Public Schools. The youngest one, we actually just started sending him to Lotus Academy, um, if you're familiar in the Germantown section of the city. Um, and that's just because he was a COVID kindergartner main, and um, them classes of 30 will not be able to accommodate the assistance that he's needed. Um, plus, we do, me and my wife do believe in a strong uh, African-centered foundation. Uh, my two, two middle ones went to Kepra. Um, when they first started school. So just that's an example of our commitment. Um, this is my 14th year with the School District of Philadelphia, so I'm still a baby. I acknowledge that. Um, I, my first four years, I was at Germantown High School until the Great Purge in 2013 when they shut down 23 schools throughout the city of Philadelphia. 95% uh, of the students going to those schools were Black or Brown students, or 98% actually. Um, so after Germantown was closed, I was laid off. And then the following year, school year, in October, I was called back and ended up in Kensington. Um, and if you know the difference between Germantown and Kensington, it took about a little, you know, a couple of years for me to adjust culturally to the reality of teaching in Kensington compared to Germantown. Um, so I taught there for eight years. Uh, during the pandemic, I received a call. Uh, I never planned to leave the classroom, mind you. And uh, a uh, person on the other side was like, I know you don't want to leave the classroom, but this position's open. The work that social studies department is very important. Do you have any suggestions? And at that point, I reevaluated everything and decided to leave the classroom. Um, so I became a social studies specialist in February 21. Um, and this past summer, uh, they opened up the director position for, for social studies. Uh, and I'm the first director of social studies in nine years. Uh, for the school district of Philadelphia. So it kind of shows you kind of the lack of focus. Uh, the last person who was in this position was Melvin Garrison, um, who I do consider a mentor along with Dana King. And if you know Melvin and Dana, they're not the same person at all. Um, but I try to bounce out them energies myself in, in the way I approach it. I also adjunct at uh, the University of Pennsylvania in uh, their graduate UTAP program, Urban Teacher Apprentices program uh, for social studies methods. Uh, I believe education is the practice of freedom. Um, and a fun fact is I graduated high school with a 1.6 GPA. Um, and I mentioned that there's two types of educators, the educator that seeks to replicate the experience that they had to their students, and the other one that wants to blow up, burn down the plantation and never return to that place. And I fall into that latter category um, as an educator, philosophically <laughs> speaking. Um, so just to lay out kind of who I am, where I'm coming from, um, I. I my 12 years teaching in the school district, I taught African-American history. Um, that's why I even wanted to come to the school district. Um, and it's, it's just so much for me. So usually when I do these things, I ask folks, we usually like have like a warm up and discussion, but due to time, we're not gonna get into all that. But I kind of wanna frame kind of when we even talk about African-American history and the teaching of it, right? And the purpose of teaching of it, what are we doing, right? What does it usually look like? Because supposedly, Philadelphia, we've been teaching Black history in schools in every school, right, uh, since 2005 as a requirement. But what does that actually, what, to what end? Why so, right? What does that look like? Um, so can I have a volunteer just to read the first uh, quote to the left side by William C. Anderson? Yes, thank you, sir. I'll volunteer. Thank you. 
Our struggles historically from enslavement to Jim Crow to now have been embraced by the state under banners of memorial and commemoration. Yet something sinister happens here when museums, schools, and institutes dedicated to the preservation of black history make that very history into something that the country needed to become what it is now. This assumes, of course, that today is satisfactory and that our struggle is finished or nearly concluded. Mm. So I, I just really wanna like have, have y'all marinate on that idea because like even the way black history is kind of shown to our children a lot of the times, right? It's like, oh, slavery, that was a long time ago. You know, Moses led some people to the promised land. Lincoln freed the slaves. The dude made peanut butter, even though he didn't. Rosa Parks was tired, so she didn't get up. Martin Luther King had a dream, and Barack Obama became president, right? And unfortunately, that has become the simplistic, generalized narrative that a lot of our children have fallen under. And all we have to look at is Juneteenth and see the ice cream sales that they tried to sell out of Walmart, right? Um, and the Target selling Black History Month things, right? So why would they embrace quite frankly, the, the biggest existential threat that this society, this country always felt uh, was there, and that's Black political and social power, right? So why would they embrace Black political social power, or in what ways do they embrace it, and how do they show it, and what's the uh, effect of our, on our children and our collective psyche when we're even talking about that? Um, with that being said, can someone read uh, the second quote by uh, Dr. Michael Gomez? All right, since we have silence, the study of Africans and their descendants. Looks like Elise was trying to. Oh, I'm sorry. She's on mute, though. The study of Africans and their descendants conforms to neither the popular nor official narrative of the nation state, as they experience are often overlooked, misrepresented, or, or characterized, if not, if not erased entirely. Yes. And so like we see that now where even just simply the thought of teaching uh, the truth, right, about the story and experiences of Black people in this society is meeting with extreme kind of like opposition, right? And that's historically always been the case within this society. But this uh, opposition is kind of using this language of no, everybody's in the fold, right? We need to stop teaching our children to be victims and we need to start, you know, and the whole thing is at the end of the day, the premise is, is that the experiences uh, and the lessons learned from black people in this society fighting for freedom and liberation for all people, not just black people have been basically kind of like erased or then generalized into this overall kind of idea that the arc of justice or the arc of the universe always bends towards justice or whatever, right? Um, and I just really want folks to marinate on this to kind of understand the idea of how when I'm when we're thinking of approaching black history in the school district of Philadelphia and breathing life back into it, what's the considerations that we're making right when we're talking about this overall picture. Um, thank you y'all. Um, here we go. So just a reminder, hopefully everybody here knows this, um, but all this uh, was started in. Uh, not even started, but kicked off, quite frankly, in an aggressive way, was the 1967 student walkout in Philadelphia, where over 3,500 students walked out um, of school demanding Black history be taught, um, you know, folks be able to rock their natural hair, wear dashikis, and what I found out recently, uh, 100 demands. Um, and all those demands are somewhat still relevant uh, to what students are demanding today in schools across the city. Um, and this, you know, after some students with Rizzo, you know, go get their black asses, you know what I mean? And all the other things that happen associated with this, some people became part of that system in Philadelphia and really culminated in 2005 with the SRC, the School Reform Commission under uh, Sa Sandra uh, Dungy Glenn uh, passed a resolution uh, making black history uh, needing to be taught in order to graduate as a graduation requirement. But also in that language, a lot of people leave out is that there's language about the integration of African-American studies into the K-12 space. The thing is, since there's no teeth behind it and simply it's just like a mandate, which just says, yeah, you should integrate it. There has been nothing really there to really push it. Uh, please jump in when you want. I, I feel like I'm talking way too much at y'all. Um, 
Are you good? All right. All right. So here we go. Um, but what are the unintended consequences? Right. And they might be intended, but I'm going to assume good uh, intentions by folks. Um, there's no required background, academic knowledge. So you have folks coming into the school district of Philadelphia and to teach African-American history, never took an African-American studies course in African-American history class. The really conception of black people in America is what's shown on the evening news, Meek Mills and maybe the Jeffersons, right? Which is extremely problematic, especially when we're talking about the racial demographic kind of like dynamics that exist within the school district of Philadelphia. And quite frankly, the experiences of teachers. Um, in 1988, in the school district of Philadelphia, the average years of experience of a teacher was 15. Now it's three to five years. So we're having a point. I remember at the beginning, I told you I'm the first director in nine years. There's teachers that have been teaching for almost a decade that never had social studies teachers that there was not a director for social studies. Think about that. That's over 50% of the teachers have never known that. So what's the implications for what the focus is and, and even the value placed on social studies, right? And people know that. Um, another thing about the no required uh, background uh, of academic knowledge is that a lot of folks don't want to teach it because they just don't feel comfortable. Not that they're not, you know what I mean? I don't want to say that they're not racist because that gives them too much deference, but they're not aggressively racist. <laughs> um, and, and so as a result of that, there is uh, a situation where they're like, oh, well, I can't talk about that, or I don't want to touch that, um, which actually does a disservice for the, the full depth of dialogue that needs to happen, especially in a course like this. Um, the original curriculum designed by Dr. Greg Carr, Dana King, wonderful, beautiful, like, you know, I learned a lot when I won't go through that curriculum. Um, but you also have to have background knowledge of African-American studies to actually navigate that curriculum. Um, because I can tell you right now, uh, most teachers won't step out their way to read Chankata Dia or read The Miseducation of the Negro. So how can we make sure that they're actually fully grasping what the curriculum is actually wanting to be conveyed, right? Um, and with the three to five year turnover of teachers, even if you build up folks you're not guaranteed those folks will be around in a couple of years. So how do you create institutionalized, sustainable structures where folks are able to be trained effectively, but also be able to understand the curriculum from a very nuanced uh, position? So uh, the original curriculum designed from an explicit academic framework, wonderful, beautiful, somewhat inaccessible to the average social studies teacher. Um, I, I mentioned the gap. Um, I mentioned the teacher turnover. Um, and the last two I kind of mentioned already that our society does, but I do want to point out in Philadelphia, we have a tendency to do this also, uh, to kind of like we're a victim of our own success. So it's like, oh, we have a, a African-American history graduation requirement course, right? We're done, right? We checked off that box. We're doing it big, right? But then as you can see in the school district of Philadelphia, there was intense training for teachers teaching this subject for the first three to four years, three to four years uh, that it started. After that, it got cut and it never returned where even most teachers, even if they get access to the curriculum, which they're unable most of the time to even fully comprehend, they might not even have access to that uh, at this point now. So it's actually doing arguably more damage than good because it fills this kind of concept, concept of like, oh, well, we're making progress. Look at much progress we're making when we all live in Philadelphia and we know what our children are facing, uh, arguably much, much, much more mirages and camouflages than we saw. Um, so I digress. So with that being said, I love Derek Bell. I love when uh, idiot folks around this country right now talk trash on like CRT, like they know what the heck that even is or that it was even remotely even being discussed at all in schools um you know after george floyd you did see an uptick of you know the best-selling books on the new york times bestseller list all be books about anti-racism right you do you did see an uptick of a cross-racial group across class of folks interest on racial inequality issues folks stuff that we've you know black folks done known and done said and screamed at the top of the lungs for generations and generations but after uh george floyd you did see this uptick 
And so just like any other uptick, when this country does kind of get off its its butt and starts asking questions like, wait a minute, that is not right. You know what I mean? And the myth comes in conflict with the reality. Um, you know, the last time we actually really saw this happen on this level was in 1970s, right? Um, you see a backlash that follows. And that backlash usually is white fear. Um, and that white fear is real. Um, and so you see in 18 states right now, they've actually even banned the ability to even talk about what I'm talking about right now. So teachers aren't even getting exposed to it, let alone exposing their own students to it. Um, and in reality, I would argue that folks are unable to break out of the indoctrination that we're all indoctrinated under, which is the mythology and the mythos of this society, right? The meritocracy, the uh, the idea that this is democracy and freedom and everything, like all those things, you know, if you know the history of Black folks in this society, you know that this society might say something, but not actually, actually mean it or do it, or only do it for a certain segment. So uh, I'm not going to read this quote off of uh, the screen for y'all, but I really want to emphasize the last piece of it. He says, peaks of progress, short-lived victories that slide into irrelevance as racial patterns adapt in ways that maintain white dominance. Derek Bell did not come into the situation and say, you know, all white people are racist, right? He said he basically was a civil rights lawyer that looked at the situation and was like, all this civil rights legislation, all these changes, but what, what's, a, you know, why are my people still struggling, quite frankly? And then he started to develop what would be known as critical race theory, but this idea of the permanence of racism, that you need to use interest, interest convergence to actually advance your concepts and get those victories at when you can get them, but also be realistic that those victories might be short-lived and actually rolled back. And we see that right now with the Voting Rights Act in 1965, as an example. Uh, what are we doing in Philadelphia? Uh, well, we're requiring a professional development uh, for all teachers who teach uh, African-American history. We're using Dr. LeGarrette King's Eight Black Historical Consciousness Principles. If you're unaware of what those are, I will share before uh, I get off. Um, we're also updating the curriculum. Um, and like I said before, the, the first one by Dr. Carr and Dana King and everybody was beautiful, very, you know, depth, you know, uh, a lot of detail. Um, we're kind of simplifying it and trying to give teachers training wheels right now. Um, and now since we have access to the internet like that and like we can embed links into Google Docs, it's a much more different game. So our updated curriculum, we're actually like literally putting the final touches and the bow on top of that right now. Um, and it's, it's, it's a much different course than it was before, but at the same time, it still hits the same ideas. Uh, we're also providing uh, additional professional development, not just for teachers, but we're inviting community members, parents, students into these professional developments also. Um, I don't know if anybody has seen it before, and I'll share this before I get off, but um, we have about a monthly uh, four-hour session on a Saturday called the Africana Studies Lecture and Workshop Series. We featured uh, uh, academics and scholars such as Dr. Hassan Jeffries, Dr. Bettina Love, Dr. Kamika Royal, um, all the way to, you know, activists on the ground really doing the work, uh, Sharif al uh, you know, uh, Gabe Bryant, uh, Ant Smith, Chris Rogers, and, and, and if you're in Philadelphia, you know these names, right? So we're really trying to provide and expose not just our teachers, but also our larger community and engage people in these larger and, and more in-depth conversations, right, um, that our society is actually running away from. Um, we also have created a team of teachers who teach the subject, have experience teaching the subject to help uh, identify uh, best practices and curate resources, which then we can also embed into the curriculum and then give guidance to not just teachers, but also administrators about what does that actually best practices of teaching this course look like in the classroom. Um, with all the controversy around the AP Africana, uh, stu African American Studies uh, program, uh, we actually in Philadelphia started the process of adopting an AP seminar content course uh, with African diaspora content uh, a year before uh, the AP was even talking about releasing the African American studies thing. Um, so it's real interesting to kick up about that when in Philadelphia, we've been actually implementing and been involved in uh, implementing what's called African diaspora content through the AP seminar course. And we were able to get seven high schools this year, all of them neighborhood high schools ranging from Bartram, Strawberry Mansion, uh, you know, 
the list goes on Kensington. Um, and like I said uh, at the beginning, four hours of paid weekend Africana studies series. Um, please give me the time because I can talk for like five hours on all these things. So keep talking. Uh, and, and, and we can listen. Okay. <laughs> Because I could talk all day. Um, okay. I just, I, I, whenever you feel like you, you want to engage us, or if anybody does have, you can just, you know, we can open up. But it, it you know, as they say, you can keep on presenting what you have. Okay, wonderful. Um, so one of the first things as a social studies director, I came in, number one, since there has not been somebody for nine years, there is no direction, right? No guidance on how to structure a social studies approach department function, you know, to make it functional. Um, of course, I, I'm blessed that I know Melvin Garrison and Dana King. So I've been able to talk to them and talk to other folks around the country. Um, but one of the first things that we did was create a guiding vision, right? Not just for African American history, but overall social studies. What do we want our students to take away from it, right? What is the purpose of uh, teaching it? Um, and I really love to emphasize that last sentence. Students will develop meaningful relationships with land, nature, and people in order to make principled, ethical decisions and work collectively towards creating a truly just society. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think our vision is not just limited to kind of like knowledge transfer. We're talking about something deeper when we're trying to emphasize hu humanizing, quite frankly. Like social studies should be humanizing folks when you're learning about it. So I want uh, folks to kind of wrestle with this idea. And I know y'all heard about it. You might say it yourself, right? There's no judgment here. How can the statement black history is American history be both true and false at the same time? So I don't know if anybody wants to take the take a shot at this to, <laughs> to approach it. But I, I know I don't know about y'all during Black History Month. I heard Black History is American history like at least three or four times a day from different people. So how can that statement be true and false at the same time? I'll take a shot at it. Oh. I, I'll say it it should be included, but it often is not. Yep. Yep. I say false simply because they're two different types of experiences. Unless you acknowledge the people of African descent and let them tell their story fully and completely on their own terms, then you have one story and that's the story, the universal story that they've been using for years. Yes. Different experience. You got to acknowledge those other experiences to be American history. Mm. It's one of the major problems. Yes, it is. I mean, that's probably and, and both of the both of y'all statements reflect why there is a push to have a Black History requirement, right? Absolutely. Separate. Um, I would even I would even like uh, like ask this: Is is it possible to talk about Black History without talking about the continent? Is it possible with uh, talking about Black History? Without no, when, when I read your statement, I said to myself, Black history is actually world history. Yeah. So, no, you can't. You have to talk about the African part first. Mm. So, I, under, I that's why I said it would be false, true and false, mm -hmm. at the same time. Because, yeah, Black history, America was built on the uh, backs of Af people of African descent, but the people of African descent also make up the world, not just America. So that's mm. all. No. And I would like to add, there's an origin story. You can't come in the middle. You've got to go from the beginning. What happened? Who did who to who? You've got to have that origin story. Um, and, and Dr. John Hendrick Clark even called it the 500 years of disruption. Not the, you know what I mean? Not the event, but a disruption, a disruptive event. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful concept. Now, I, I, the reason why I'm asking this is because I really want to show you how we're going to problematize it for our students here in Philadelphia. 
our students should be thinking about this question in some type of way, right? And it should be debated. There should not be a clear type of conversation that is just like this is it and like move on. You do want students to kind of engage because quite frankly, it is said black history is American history repeatedly, uh, not just a little bit, repeatedly. Um, so think about the implications, especially when we're thinking about it in relation to the quotes from the very beginning about how black history is even framed and shown to us. Now, um, one of the things we did uh, when thinking of a new curriculum was like, well, what's an overarching essential question? What is the whole purpose of even learning these stories, right? The, these histories. And one of the essential question that we came up with was what lessons does the black liberation struggle provide for the global fight against oppression? So if you actually look at the history of black people in America, regardless of if the if folks agreed or had the same tactics, right? Like Malcolm said, people always uh, confusing uh, methods with objectives, right? Um, look at the objective, right? And when you look at the objective, you start to notice that, you know, historically black people in America really have been fighting for all people's freedom, all people's liberation. And very few groups can mention that on a consistent basis as much as black people in the American context, right? Or black people even around the world. So when we're saying, what lessons can we learn? So what can we learn from a David Walker and how he did it? Why was he such a threat that they, you know, don't even know how the man was killed in, on his, in his doorway, right? How can we even talk about, you know, the concepts and ideas associated with Ella Baker and her question on how to organize in comparison to her critiques of Martin King's charismatic leadership model, right? These are the things that we want our students to talk about. We don't want them to just know, you know, Martin Luther King had a dream and think that he died the next day, right? Even though he lived five years later, we want them to really engage in the fact that when King got killed, 44% of black people had a positive opinion. That means 56% had a negative opinion of them. Why? How does it relate to anti-war service, anti-imperialism? Is there intellectual genealogy in the black radical tradition that you can folks can point to that shows that there's a line of thought in opposition to imperialism or even in support of such in, in hopes of more increased rights, right? These are the things we want folks to talk about. So how are we formatting this? Um, well, first, our curriculum is textbook independent. You don't need a textbook in your classroom. Shoot, half the time them textbooks lie. Um, <laughs> the other half, they're incorrect, especially for a subject like African-American history. Um, and if it is good, it is complicated to go through. So we have made our uh, curriculum textbook independent, but people can still use the textbook as another source to prop up whatever lesson that they're doing. Um, it's developed by teachers who actually teach the subject for um, a certain amount of years in the field still. Uh, um, me and my colleague, Akanke Washington, are the only ones like not who do, don't teach African-American history right now that are writing curriculum. Everybody else currently teaches it and are, are good in my measurements, right? Uh, we're using Dr. Uh, LeGarrett King's Eight Black Historical Consciousness Principles. And before we get off again, I'll, I'll show you what those are. Um, we're providing training wheels, which is like, uh, start the lesson like with this video clip. Ask the students these guided questions. Here is two primary sources, have break the students up in groups, da, da, da. Like we're literally, that's what our curriculum looks like for day to day, week to week. It's a very like step-by-step -step kind of process. And then our my goal is to make it into three frames. So like I said, we're putting a bow on the revisions for what we're calling the national African-American history curriculum. So that's like looking at African-American history through the nationalistic American lens. Uh, then after we're done, hopefully this summer, we'll be starting what I'm calling a local Philadelphia, I mean, black history, which is looking at black history from Philadelphia and then telling the story just from that. Um, which you can do, right, from the, the wonderful story of Philadelphia. And then finally, after we're done that, we're moving toward an international so we can include anti-colonial theory, spend enough time on Haiti that it deserves, and actually get into Caribbean and Latin American, you know, resistance, 
social political, uh, Afro social political theory and everything, and even the current kind of uh, issues around colorism that still exists within those societies today. So as you can see, we I recognize right from jump, there's no way you can fit that in one year. <laughs> um, and so, and also we wanna give teachers as much uh, leeway and access points that they can. So if you teach at say Edison High School in Philadelphia, which is like 99% Latino, right? Even though I would say more than half of them kids is black, you might wanna draw on the international more than the national and then throw in the Philly pieces based on what you think the students will relate to. That's what we wanna to get to. Ishmael, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, in relationship to, uh, or one thing of the, in, is to be able to bring in, say, the um, local aspect, since Black Docent Collective is focusing primarily on local in relationship to Philadelphia. How is there a, a role that um, community organizations that are dealing with, say, local um, history can be engaged with, you know, the process, especially when you're not dealing with textbooks? Is there a way to make it to integrate the community aspect that is developing a historical narrative, a historical interpretation of, say, local um, Philadelphia history and what what the curriculum development that the teachers are providing to the students? Uh, yes, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that, I mean, that's the whole idea, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, we since we'll be done the national, right? we won't have to worry about a non-existent, non-accessible curriculum, which was the case before, right? Which allows us more leeway and more time to develop those partnerships with community organizations, individuals, um, stakeholders, like folks who have been involved, right? Um, in, the, in the struggle for human rights in the city of Philadelphia for decades, right? Um, I want all those folks at the table um, looking at it, reviewing it, whatever way they feel like folks can fit in, um, it is. So the process of that, that's why I'm hoping by this summer, because that process will look different than what I, I've ever done um, here yet. But at the same time, I do want to just talk that uh, into existence. Uh, my boss is supportive of it right now, and then get the ball rolling by this summer, even if it might take longer than just one year. You know what I mean? Because oh, yeah. I recognize getting that many folks, having it really comprehensive, accessing those resources. Like we're gonna have to go back to the drawing table a lot and be like, oh wait, I didn't know that history. That changes this overall story, how we're gonna include it, how we're gonna complicate it, all those type of conversations. And then even like tying it to locations in the city for potential field trips or walking trips for students on the younger grades, uh, even the older grades, and then what that would look like. So like, we're talking about actually building a more comprehensive, united, uh, you know, black history consortium, quite frankly, in the city of Philadelphia, because we're, we're, we're here, right? We're all over the place, but we're here. Um, if we can get folks together on the same page, working together, talking together, even when we're talking about the historical uh, heritage museum type situations, all the way down to the community organization seeking to end gun violence through some type of storytelling, right? All these folks need to be involved into the conversation about what a uh, year long black history curriculum looks like from the Philadelphia uh, lens. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm, I can go on for a, um, so right here, this is Dr. LeGarrette King. He's out, he's in the University of Buffalo right now. He was at Mizzou. Uh, he has a, 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 a car, he has a center called the Carter Center uh, for the teaching of K through 12 black history. Um, I'm, I met him, he came up to Philadelphia when me and Yassin Muhammad uh, started the Philadelphia Black History Collaborative. Um, he's always supported from then, and he actually even runs his own co uh, conferences around teaching of Black history in Buffalo now. Uh, this summer, he's having one about the 50th anniversary of uh, hip hop. Uh, so it's just very interesting to get him involved. But he actually wrote a book, uh, a uh, journal article called Black History is Not American History towards a framework of Black historical consciousness. So I'll share that article with y'all before we get off to here. Let me get that for y'all now so I can have it on deck. Um, sorry. Actually, I probably should just wait right now. All right. 
So, so uh, these are the five parts uh, of professional de uh, development that we did with teachers this year who teach African American history using the eight black historical consciousness principles. So first we did introduction, what is that? Then we went into question making and intellectual preparation, right? How do you make questions? And when you're thinking about making a lesson, practice and application, we actually have teachers develop those lessons and go through those intellectual preparation uh, processes. Uh, how do you teach enslavement and resistance, right? Uh, one thing that uh, students in Philadelphia, at least the ones I taught throughout the years, like, oh, slavery again? And then by the time we're done slavery, we're like, I never learned that before. And be like, yeah, because the slavery that you were taught was the same nonsense over and over and over again. That is not the story that our students need to learn. They need to learn the story of resilience. They need to learn the story of resistance. They need to learn the story of the humanness, the humanity uh, that Black folks brought to this society. Um, and then going beyond Black history. So how what can we learn from, say, the precarious relationship of Black people to citizenship in this society and the history of that? And how can that help us understand or help immigrant uh, folks understand kind of their experience within the American context even deeper? So those are examples. This is also what our curriculum looks like. Uh, we have essential questions. Those These are subtopics. And then enduring understandings, we give the teachers the objectives, the big ideas. And as you can see this, we're developing this ourselves. So like an enduring understanding. Uh, too much information about African as people have been distorted over the last 500 years to assist in the rationalization of racialized exploitation. Students need to know that. You know what I mean? When going through this unit. Um, and they need to understand these kind of concepts and ideas. So differentiate the theoretical concepts related to the origins of humanity. Describe major themes related to the development of civilization around along the Nile Valley, right? These are things that's, that is there for teachers to straight up take, put in, and then within our thing, we even give hyperlinks to documents and everything for them to present to the students. This is an example of what I was describing about kind of like the training wheels for, for each one. Um, this is an example of a topic that we go over about African presence in early America. So if you're familiar with the, uh, the work of Dr. Ivan uh, Sertima, he made the case that Africans were presence in the, present in the Americas tens of 10,000 years before uh, you know Europeans. And so we use his uh, research to kind of ask students is there enough evidence to prove Africans were present in early America? And then what does that mean? So as you can see, you know, the lesson will begin with students working independently to do da da da, da and then it's hyperlinked. Uh, next teacher will display a picture of an Olmec head. There's an Olmec head picture. You teacher can click it out, print it, whatever way you want to do it. And then they, the students have to write like a five to seven sentence sentence analysis detailing what their initial perception about who made it, where it's from, how old it is, you know, and then uh, we give them uh, Washington Post article uh, about it before Columbus roots of a dispute that discusses the controversy surrounding the notion Africans sailed to Americans before Europeans. So this is just an example. This is only one lesson. This is what all of our lessons within our curriculum look like now. Now, what's guiding our framework? Well, like Derek Bell, racism is a permanent feature of American society. So we need to stop pretending like it's not. We need to stop pretending that, you know, that the story specifically of Black people is somehow the same. Uh, because when we're talking about Black people's story, especially in the American context, you're talking about a very unique story that gives us a deeper understanding about how this society operates. Um, when we're talking about racism, anti-Blackness is at the the foundation of that, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously. Uh, there's narratives that perpetuate the mythology of racial progress, devalue the collective contribution of folks who actually like gave up their lives, sacrificed, uh, you know, benefits simply just to fight for people's other rights. The citizenship status thing that I've already referred to, um, and then theories uh, developed and informed the, and derived from the Black struggle for freedom in America have been influential in resistance struggles of various groups seeking increased rights across the world. 
I recently just saw uh, a video clip of this 12 year old Palestinian boy in the occupied territories rapping over a beat about what it like growing up in the Palestinian territories using black vernacular slang in his music, right? Think about the gravity of that. Talking about the reality of his oppression in a current situation so far away from the streets of New York, speaking that truth in the same type of way that children back in the turn of, uh, turn of the 80s was doing it in New York, right? Talking about the oppression, talking about fighting back. Um, and then this last quite, uh, last statement, which I actually throw at teachers yeah. um, in Philadelphia. 